the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good morning, everyone. Well, as it says on the back of the bulletins, your bulletins today, by the grace of God, we have reached the third Sunday of Lent, which is the midpoint of Lent. And uh, by now, Mother Church is sensing that those who have chosen to enter into the arena of the fast, who have chosen to take the path that rises to, toward Pascha, by now, halfway point may be growing a little weary. For those who have tried to fast, to keep the fast, at least some semblance of the fast, but then perhaps have fallen and then they have to get up again and try again and fallen and those who are attending services and sometimes miss a service and they have to get up and try again and those who are trying to achieve some kind of union with Christ and fall and get up this constant rising and falling mother church senses that you may be growing weary at this time and so like a good mother she goes into her spiritual cupboard to look for nourishment for her children, us. And today, she finds the symbol of the cross. She places the cross in the heart of Lent to refresh us, to renew us, to find a place of rest. The Greek word is anakufisi, anakufisi. Not anakuba, anakufisi. <laughs> Although, uh, by all rights, Anakuba is a, a source of uh, respite as well. And for those of you who have warmed yourself in the sunshine of her smile. But um, the, the Anakufisi of the cross is what we're celebrating today. And you may be wondering, and legitimately so, how is the cross, that instrument of torture and shame, and death, how can that be a source of anakufisi, of refreshment? In fact, Father Paul, to tell you the truth, the cross is in my own life. My own personal crucifixion, my own personal Golgotha is not a resting place for me. I was uh, listening to a podcast this past week from a former classmate of mine. His name was Nick Constance at the time. Now he is a monk on Mount Athos, Father Maximus. And he was describing in vivid language what the cross means to us on this side of life. Illnesses come upon us, that's a cross. We suffer injustices, that's a cross. False accusations, disabilities, the pain of being betrayed, the loss of a spouse, the sickness of a child, a parent who didn't love you, that's a cross. The cross is where we end up when things fall apart, when dreams die, when careers collapse, when marriages end. The cross is where we are when we don't know where we are. The cross is what we're doing when we don't know what we're doing. So Father, how can the church consider the cross a resting place? This is why we have to have more than a vague understanding of the cross of Christ, my friends. Our all-powerful God has it within his power to remove every cross, every wound, with just a wave of his hand. And one day he will do that, on the last day. There will be no more tears. But in the meantime, on this side of life, rather than removing our cross, rather than being afar from our suffering, he chooses to embrace it. Remember what I told you, or what I asked you to think about on a Good Friday. I don't know if it was last year or two years ago, I asked you, what did St. Gregory the theologian mean when he said, that which is not assumed is not healed. That which is not assumed is not healed. 
by assuming our wounds, and by co-suffering with us, the cross has become an entry point of the Lord's power. The avenue of mercy, nowhere in our lives are we closer to the Lord than in our suffering. How did the psalmist put it? Blessed is the man whose help is from thee. He's made us sense in his heart, in the veil of weeping, in the place which he's appointed. So the Lord's strategy to bring healing to us on this side of life was not to avoid suffering, but to embrace it and then transform it. Last Wednesday, when Father Gregory gave his beautiful talk and how beautiful it was to be back in your presence on a, for an in-house Lenten lecture, the full house, I asked the question, something of that question. How do we transform, just take one wound that we suffer sometimes. How does loneliness transform into solitude? And I asked you to give me some responses. Text me, call me, uh, email me. How does loneliness turn, transform into solitude? And I've got some great answers. And it's curious that the devil plays the same game in a sense, he, with it, using a slightly different strategy. He seeks, he's in the transformation business as well, but he doesn't seek to transform our woundedness and our brokenness. He seeks to transform our virtues. And so, to that sensitive one, he sort of wheels and deals and makes that person hypersensitive, abnormally sensitive, to that one who has cultivated the virtue of love. He turns that love into, I don't know, idolization or lust, to the one who has cultivated the fear of God, he turns that good fear, that uh, respectful fear of God, into a spirit of timidity toward men. But rather than going into all that, let me begin to conclude by asking you, how can we transform our suffering? I want you to remember there were two thieves on Golgotha with Christ. One on his left, one on his right. Each had very different reactions to their suffering. The one reviled and rebuked and cursed everyone around him, including Christ himself, blaming him, calling him to account, angry at him, refusing to see his own sin refusing to take responsibility for his own faults, refusing to ask for forgiveness. The other thief, the grateful thief, in his suffering, sensed the presence of the Lord. He sensed the co-suffering of the Lord on his behalf. He sees his own fault. He acknowledges his own responsibility for his own suffering. I can't tell you, when I hear that language from my people, I can't tell you how much I admire you. By doing so, suffering is transformed. This thief, the grateful thief, begins to experience by acknowledging his faults and by sensing the presence of Christ, he begins to feel joy and hope on his cross. And he authors one of the greatest prayers in all of Christendom that we still say to this day, Lord, remember me. You come into your kingdom. And this common thief who has no business in heaven becomes the first paradise, but the first citizen of paradise. So let me uh, ask you, which of the two are we? How do we typically respond to the crosses in our lives? Perhaps at different times, we resemble both thieves. We are about to process with the Holy Cross at this time. As we do, 
Think how you, your cross can be an extension of Christ's cross. Think how he co-suffered with you. Think of the presence of Christ as this cross comes around. Acknowledge your own responsibility for your own cross. And let's see if we can experience that refreshment, that anakufisi, as we come around with the Holy Cross. Please join us at this time. <laughs>